Hello. Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm David Huberman from ICANN. This is Jia Rong Lo from ICANN. We will be joined by Pablo Hinojosa from AP NIC. He is on his way right now, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome. I am David Huberman from ICANN's Office of the CTO, and I would like to welcome you to this morning's session entitled DNS, a Foundation for a Safe, Secure, and Interoperable Internet. Interoperability is a key word for this IGF. When we open an app on our phone or we navigate to a website in our web browsers, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes uh, that we don't necessarily see, right? There's an entire global infrastructure of devices and software which exists to transmit and process all the data to and from our devices, right? Wi-Fi, fiber optic cables, routers, switches, firewalls, these elements, they're all working together seamlessly so that when we ask our devices for data, that data is retrieved and sent to us at the speed of light. We commonly use this term, interoperability, to describe that seamless interaction. And interoperability is the primary reason the internet went from a small scientific experiment in the 1960s to the biggest and most impactful invention in modern history. And the internet is globally interoperable because all the network operators around the world have chosen to adapt common standards. So today, this morning, we are going to discuss two of some of the most important building blocks of this system of standards and these building blocks make up the Internet's unique identifier system. We're going to talk about names and numbers. Names are found in the DNS, the domain name system. And numbers are found in things like IP addresses. We're going to try and make this morning's session as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask them at the microphone while we're talking at the end of each topic. Um, and, but please, use the opportunity that we have brought people from around the world to answer any of the questions that you have. So we have two speakers this morning um, I'm to talk about names. We welcome Jia Rong Lo, ICANN's Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement and the Managing Director for the Asia Pacific Region. And to discuss internet numbers, my friend Pablo Hinojosa, the Strategic Engagement Director for APNIC, the Regional Internet Registry for the A Asia Pacific Region. Do you wrong? To you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. It's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Jarong. I'm based in Singapore. I look after the ICANN Asia Pacific office. Uh, we cover the Asia Pacific region. Can I share my slides, please? Trouble the. So, as what David talked about a little bit. Um, Typically, when we think about internet, a lot of us think about internet as 3G or 4G or Wi-Fi or the landlines, fiber optic cables. That's one way we think about internet, right? Another kind of way of thinking about internet would be all the content you see. What's on Facebook or Google, uh, all the content that you see online, and the social issues that you, uh, we experience or problems that we experience on the content part of it. Now, um, in our space, when we talk about internet, really it's the technology that enables my device to connect to your device. And what do we need uh, as part of this technology? There are three things. The first is we have to code our computers or devices to speak the same language. In technical terms, they use the same protocol parameters. Second one is that every device needs to have an address, and it's actually an IP address. And the third one, because humans find it very hard to remember four sets of three numbers, and now we move to IP version six, it's six sets of alphanumeric numbers. So it's very hard to remember. So we need a name, and that's domain names. So the technical functioning of the internet requires unique identifiers. So uh, it's, uh, it, I'll use another slide later to illustrate this. So this is a little bit messy of a slide, but follow me, there are numbers on there, one, two, three. So just follow me in terms of the stages. So for example, when you want to go online, you go to your browser and you type www.domain.org right at the top. 
so everyone knows how to key in a domain name in the browser, right? What happens at the backend? That's when step one, your ISP's recursive resolver would want to look for this website for you, but it has to find the server, wherever it sits in the world, that houses that information to send it to your device. So when you type www.domain.org, your ISP's recursive resolver would ask this question in the system. Or where is the IP address for www.domain.org? It will ask this question. And who does it ask first? It will go to a root server to ask this question. And the root server would actually won't know exactly where this IP address is. But it knows where the top level domain server's IP address is, which is the .org domain uh, IP address. So after step one, the recursive resolver gets the IP address only for the top level domain server .org comes back again to ask the .org server where is www.domain.org's IP address. So it goes through a referral system. So it asks the root, then it asks the top level domain server, then it asks the second level domain server and so on until it gets the IP address of the website you want to visit. So notice we talk about IP address and domain names already. And eventually, it will reach the domain.org server. And the domain.org server would have the IP address of www.domain.org, which is step three on the slide. And it would, tell your, your, uh, it would ask you to connect at 192.0.2.0. So this process happens every single time. Every single time you want to go to a website, this process would happen. Um, and it's quite miraculous because all these servers are placed in different locations all over the world. But the process by which it happens, happens at about 10 milliseconds. It's really, really quick. And it's very interesting that uh, anybody is able to join this network. And as long as you share the same protocols. So I already mentioned in this one slide, domain names, IP addresses. And if you use the same set of protocols, you join the same network. Now, who's involved, just very briefly, in terms of this DNS query or DNS resolution process? So I mentioned the moment you type www.domain.org in your browser, your ISP has a recursive resolver that looks for the IP address for you. So ISPs are involved in this one first step. Then they have to go and ask the root service. And who operates the root service? There are 12 organizations globally operating uh, the, these root servers that provide this service. Then after that, who operates the .org servers? They are the top level domain registries. So .org is, is operated by a company called uh, Public in, uh, Internet Registry, PIR. Uh, .com, you might, whom uh, you may be more familiar with, operates, uh, is operated by a company called VeriSign. And there are also the country code top level domains, like here in Japan, .jp. .jp is operated by a company called JPRS, and so on and so forth. Now, at the second level, domain.org, uh, typically a company or a person will buy this domain. So like, you know, facebook.com is owned by Facebook or Meta. Uh, Google is owned by Google and so on. Then they are called registrants. People who buy the domain names are called registrants in our space. And if you need to want to buy the domain name, you need to buy it from a company like GoDaddy. So you buy it from a registrar. So typically, this, these are the people in the, uh, the ecosystem. And after getting the domain name, you need to host the information onto a server. So they, you need the, the service of a hosting provider. Sometimes the registrar is also your hosting provider. Sometimes it's not. Uh, you could also be your own hosting provider as well. So there are various players in the ecosystem. And this is the beauty of the internet, as what David mentioned the interoperability, because not any one single organization or person is controlling the internet. In just one slide, just demonstrating, just looking for a website, just to access and connect to a website, there are so many different players involved already. And that's why it's very important for us when we think about internet governance that we have everyone be participating in it. Now, this uh, slide just very quickly highlights that, you know, uh, there are vulnerabilities and issues, which we all talk about a lot when it comes to internet governance, because there could be attacks on the domain name system. 
And this is one, I'll just point out, you know, that without covering in detail, we can talk about it if there is time, but there are vulnerabilities and we as a community uh, need to work together in terms of how to address these issues. I'll talk a bit about that later. Now, if the domain name system does not work, there is no global internet. Within the technical uh, community, uh, a lot of experts talk about the DNS being the glue, the glue that holds the internet together because everyone is using the same set of unique identifiers to connect to the internet. Now, if you want to use a different set, basically you're setting up a different set of internet or intranet. So if the, the fact that we are all using one single internet now is because we are all using the same set of unique identifiers. If we have different groups of people choosing to use different sets of unique identifiers, they have different intranets, and basically we have no global internet. Now, we, when we talk about internet, like I mentioned, we are very excited about a lot of new things like artificial intelligence. That's the main buzzword of today. Just last year, we were talking about blockchain and metaverse. Those are the buzzwords last year. Things keep changing very quickly. But all of these are called internet-enabled technologies. You, we can develop them and take advantage of their uh, innovation because we have a single global internet today. If the single internet, global internet we have today no longer exists, these potential new technologies that will, may change our lives will, impact, may, will be impacted. So the, the ability for new innovation might be limited and restricted. So something for us to think about. Now, moving on to a similar thread, um, but we need to talk about multi-stakeholder internet governance. That's what this internet governance forum is for. Multi-stakeholders, different stakeholders all coming together and talking about how can we further improve the internet or resolve certain issues that we face. So remember the unique identifiers, each category of unique identifiers are managed by a different organization uh, or platform. I find using a platform might be a better word to, to call it. So in, in the space of domain names, it is by an organization called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, whom David and I both work for. In the space of IP addressing, how IP addresses are distributed in the regions is managed by regional internet registries. And here in the Asia Pacific region, it's managed by Pablo's organization called APNIC. He'll talk a bit more about that later. And in the space of protocol parameters, what should be the size of a packet? How large should the packet size be? Uh, you know, IP version for addresses have run out. Uh, what's the new version that we should think about for people to come on? These problems are called internet standards and they are managed by the Internet Engineering Task Force, which David will later talk about as well. So all of these three organizations or platforms are open for any person who's interested to participate and they are governed by the multi-stakeholder model. So I'll take the next part just to talk very briefly about ICANN and what we do. So in, for ICANN, our role is to coordinate the Internet's unique identifiers, and we do touch all of the domain names, IP addresses, and um, protocols in some ways. So I'll just briefly explain this. Um, in terms of domain names, I mentioned ICANN is the platform for community members to discuss the evolution of domain names. And one example is, um, you know, today if you want to buy a .com domain name, it's quite saturated, so it's quite hard to buy. I use this example. My friend, his name is Marcus Go. He wanted to set up his own website, so he wanted to buy his own domain name. But Marcus Go is already bought, so he bought a domain name called Marcus Go Marcus Go .com, double the length. It's quite funny, uh, but that talks about the saturation of that space. So the domain name community in ICANN decided that actually we should avail more top-level domains for people to use. So in 2012, uh, the domain name system was expanded. So you can actually have domain names like .london, .paris, even domain names in Chinese, Arabic, Cyrillic scripts. So that's the expansion of that. So anything to do with domain names, 
uh, policy is discussed at ICANN. Now, for ICANN, we also coordinate through another function within ICANN, uh, IP addresses. Basically, the function allocates IP addresses to the regional internet registries, and they, they, they distribute it further. Um, in terms of protocols, the function, which is in short is called IANA, I -A -N -A, uh, is the center, central repository for protocol registries. So when the IETF decides on a new standard, the IANA function within ICANN records it as the standard, and then it's referred to each time. Um, so uh, that's the other part when it comes to IP addresses and protocols. Now the third part is the IANA function also assigns the top level domains into the root. So it assigns the operators of the top level domains. I mentioned very signed earlier for .com, PIR for .org and so on. So IANA has that relationship with the top level domains. Even for the countries, IANA is the one that has that um, assigns the operators. So like for Singapore, SGNIC, IANA has that relationship with SGNIC and assigns .sg uh, with SGNIC. Now the, the current discussions at ICANN, these are very wordy slides, so bear with me. Um, the current discussions at ICANN when it comes to domain names has a direct relationship with the issues that you are concerned about. So for example, on cybersecurity, everyone's most concerned about cybersecurity today. So the community as a whole um, talks about this cybersecurity issue from another term called domain name system abuse, DNS abuse. And over the past years, uh, various groups and stakeholders, including governments, have been calling on ICANN to do more to combat DNS abuse. And this conversation has reached a, a very good uh, outcome. So in late 2022, registries and registrars who have a contract with ICANN, they propose to update the agreement that they have with ICANN uh, to specifically include language that helps them combat domain name system abuse. So DNS abuse is also better defined today when a few years ago, we were also uh, even thinking about how to define it. So DNS abuse now means malware, botnets, phishing, farming, and spam. Uh, spam in, in that it serves as a delivery mechanism for other forms of DNS abuse. So these categories are uh, categorized under DNS abuse. And uh, when governments are concerned about DNS abuse or cybersecurity, uh, this conversation is something that they are part of. Now, another area would be data privacy, which is also amongst policymakers and regulators you're very concerned about. Um, this has been a topic that's been discussed at ICANN for a number of years now. And it started off with the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. Uh, there is a registration data lookup system. Basically, uh, it tells you who is the registrant of a domain name, who bought the domain name. And cybersecurity law enforcement agencies use this system to fight cybercrime. Because if there is a website that houses like illegal pharmaceuticals or child pornography, the law enforcement agencies uses the uh, who is system or registration data lookup to find out who, where is this registrant based in. If they can, they will look for this person straight away. But with the data privacy regulation, all of the personal data, contact name, the home or email address, phone numbers have to be redacted. And as a result, law enforcement agencies can't use this uh, inf information anymore. And they have to individually ask registrars for that information. So this became a challenge, because on the one hand, we have to protect uh, data privacy. But on the flip side, how can law enforcement then f do, do their work properly? So it became a conversation that happened at ICANN. And again, after a few years, the ICANN community agreed to launch a registration data request service. Basically, it's a centralized service that requesters like law enforcement agencies can go into the system and just request for the information for, uh, for whatever website they're looking for. And the registrars on the other end would then feed information accordingly in the system. Because right now, the problem is 
uh, law enforcement agency or even Interpol, they've complained to me before. When they need information about a certain website, they have to write individually to a registrar to get it. But when they investigate, they usually investigate domain names in thousands. So do they write a thousand emails just to ask for a thousand websites? It's very challenging. So having a centralized system allows for that convenience to, uh, uh, so that the law enforcement agencies no longer have to write to registrars individually. Now, we are, have, we are in the midst of launching the, the pilot system. And uh, right now in September, registrars are being onboarded. And in November, we would like to invite law enforcement agencies, cybersecurity professionals, even IP attorneys to come onto the system as well so that they can use the system uh, to get the information that they need. So the more people that join this system, it's called the Registration Data Request Service at the bottom of the slide, RDRS, Registration Data Request Service. Um, the more people join the system and use it, the more data we will have in terms of how to improve it. So coming from uh, wherever you are in the world, we'd like to invite you to work with us to encourage your law enforcement agencies or cybersecurity agencies to join the RDRS system. So if you'd like to find out more, reach out to me after this session. We'll be happy to answer any questions. So that really covers uh, the few points I have. And looking ahead, there will be many more issues as we use internet more and more. And how will they affect the technical functioning of the internet is something all of us, different stakeholders, have to come together to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Jirong. So Jirong told us a lot this morning about the domain name system and how it allows us as humans to use words that we understand semantically in order to reach sites. But the funny thing is, computers don't really use those names to communicate with each other. When computing devices talk to each other, they don't talk to each other via the domain name. Instead, they talk to each other via their IP addresses. I'm David. This is Jia Rong. That's Pablo. We address each other with those names. Hey, Jia Rong. That's how we talk to one another as human beings. But the computers talk to each other with IP addresses. And behind that is the fundamental system of communication upon which the uh, internet is built. Yes, sir. Can you go to the microphone, please? Yeah, can you please go to the microphone so others can hear you? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Honorable Olajide uh, from Nigeria. I'm a legislator. Um, as you were speaking, you know the old world is very aware about IP spoofing. IP spoofing, when you now start talking about artificial intelligence, I see some areas of concerns. Because let's say, for example, I'm to use my voice to activate a bomb, as an example. And the name of the bomb says Chong. And Chong is listed in about five different countries. Which one? Because I could actually spoof the IP of the one in Nigeria or the one somewhere around the world. Because majority of the vulnerabilities that we have today is all around IP. You know, people masking names and masking IP addresses for vulnerabilities. So what are we doing in terms of those areas? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. You don't talk about that. No? Okay, so we have been building this type of security to fight exactly these types of issues into the routing system. Pablo is going to talk about the regional internet registries with the IP addresses that they run. One of the things that Pablo's organization is in part responsible for is helping secure routing so that IP spoofing is less effective and one day ineffective because we're able to use signatures, we're able to use security features to verify that the IP address you are pretending to be, well, we can see that it's not your IP address. So we're working through protocol development and through good operations 
uh, to apply even more and advance security to help address issues such as this. Thank you for this opportunity. This discussion now is becoming very hot. We started in Nigeria for the, the African School Internet Governor and uh, the African Internet Governance Forum and the Forum on the Internet Freedom in Africa in Tanzania. And now here the discussion now is becoming very interesting. So now I, I want to ask a question uh, from your uh, preliminary introduction. You talked about the beauty of the internet that nobody has the, the singular authority or control over it because it has so many actors on it, the interoperability of the, of the internet. But I'm wondering how, if it is uh, a multi-stakeholder platform that everybody is uh, on board, and then a single entity will just put it off one day. How possible is that? By shutting down. Thank you. Thank you. So. In the space that I described in the domain name system, so if we are using the same set of unique identifiers, basically no one organization can block somebody else in that sense, in the sense that .sg or .vn or .cn, et cetera, will always exist. Because right now it's managed by ICANN as an organization. We are a non-political organization and neutral globally. So we provide that as a global service to everybody. Now, there is a separate layer which you can go up a little bit, which is whether you can get content in and out of your country in terms of internet shutdowns. So that is a different layer from the, the domain name system. So if you're talking about that area, you can then use you know, uh, blocking uh, methods to block your citizens from being able to view certain websites that's uh, to enter your, your space. So you have to work with your internet serv service providers within your country, and that happens. So they, happens, they happen in different layers. So the thing about at the domain name system uh, layer, which is what I was describing, it's really different stakeholders all coming together and being a part of it. So that's why we talk about as long as we, have, we are using this DNS, we're using one single internet. But if somebody doesn't want to be part of it, then they have their own set. And there are existing, actually, uh, systems that are not part of the uh, global DNS that we have today. And they actually, they do exist. And we just call them intranets, largely, or other systems that they are using. Yes, please. Hi, thank you for uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Maha Abdel Nasser. I'm a member of parliament from Egypt. Um, actually, it's very tricky when we say that uh, we will prevent people from hiding their uh, IP addresses to prevent the phishing and the uh, electronic lies and all these things. And at the same time, in a lot of dictatorships, as you said, and they already block some some websites so people ha have to go through vpns and hide their ip addresses <laughs> so they can actually access these websites so it's it's very complicated we need of course a safe environment a safe internet but at the same time we need it to be um, uh, it cares for the human rights and it encourages the democracy. So how can we solve this equation? <laughs> Thank you. This is getting much more interesting that what my presentation was going to be about. So I don't know if you would mind that we sort of expand on these very relevant questions. And, and I do think that there is a lot of value to, uh, um, to explain different layers and different technologies and different solutions and uh, different challenges that are yet to be addressed. Um, so uh, when um, the honorable member of parliament asked about IP spoofing, uh, and then 
question about the different problems that can arise through voice recognition or through um, catching uh, a terrorist attempt uh, on time. So right there in those series of sentences, there were many technologies that uh, could have been used or misused in order to achieve uh, bad behavior or a uh, crime uh, eventually. So something that uh, always is done in incident response or incident mitigation, the first thing is to know what technology is being used how and who is doing this, right? Eventually what you would like is to uh, arrive to an attribution uh, solution. Um, so uh, starting with IP spoofing, um, IP addresses, and I was going to talk a little bit about that, are not necessarily relating one-to-one -to, -one to individuals. Uh, there are, yes, um, almost more than half of the individuals in this planet uh, connected to the internet. There are many more that are still yet to connect to the internet, but there are many more devices connected to the network than actual individuals. And IP addresses, IP numbers, uh, are for all kinds of things and devices that are connected to the internet. So um, there could be around 25 to 30 billion devices right now connected to the internet. Uh, and only about, uh, what, 4.5 or 5 billion uh, individual users there. And by the way, the protocols that Jaron was talking about, they are very interesting because at the beginning, the addressing space of unique numbers was only 4.2 billion unique addresses. So there are not even one address per one device connected on their network right now. Well, actually there is, because a solution has been found many years ago to a different, much larger IP address space, which is IPv6. So obviously when you are talking about IP spoofing or what is happening, you need to know whether it is an IPv4, IPv6, and uh, how it is being done. Um, in terms of uh, spoofing again, um, the IP addressing system works from like very, very big blocks of numbers, um, the whole set of, of address space, IPv4, 4.2 billion addresses, or IPv6, which is trillion of a trillion of a trillion uh, unique numbers uh, uh, space. So with that uh, enormous pool, that is um, sort of divided, let's say, at a very large continental level, uh, particularly five, five uh, regional internet registries. Uh, and these are five different sets of communities and five different organizations that um, basically allocate uh, very large uh, blocks of numbers to networks. As you know, the internet is a network of networks. There are, um, um, what is it, around 80,000 autonomous system numbers, um, which are autonomous networks interconnected. Um, and uh, there are uh, how many uh, prefixes uh, announced? Uh, 1.1 million blocks of, uh, or little chunks of those IP addresses. And those are assigned to those networks. Uh, autonomous networks. And those networks that operate in the private, in the public sector, et cetera, et cetera, uh, then they allocate to their clients, their, their sub-networks, et cetera, et cetera. So it is very, very down the stream where you can pinpoint an individual uh, to um, an IP address. And it's not usually a one-to-one -one relationship. So um, the, the issue uh, mostly is to keep uh, the, the registries at the um, uh, upper levels uh, accurate in, in the sense that they relate to the networks that operate um, those addresses and then uh, those uh, networks will um, assign those numbers to uh, the individuals and that's where the problem of uh, spoofing might happen. All also as um, the member of parliament from Egypt was saying there is also an element of um, uh, virtual private networks or VPNs and how they are used, et cetera, et cetera. But those are also other technologies that do not reside on that level of, of addressing that we're talking about. Um, then uh, for voice recognition, 
I cannot even sort of start how that technology works, uh, but what I want to uh, finish that answer with, uh, as David was saying, there have been um, enormous efforts to add uh, encryption uh, into um, the, the DNS uh, and into the uh, routing configuration in order for uh, certifying and be uh, more uh, sure that uh, the uh, networks or organizations that are using those set of addresses or those uh, registries uh, are the ones that actually uh, are authorized to do that in order to prevent uh, misuse, etc. Um, would that help in terms of uh, beginning to answer this? Um, and then I can run a little bit of the presentation that I have to summarize uh, some of these issues. Yeah, just to add to what Pablo is saying, I think the, the key message really is that there are many different layers uh, when we talk about internet. And it's important to know the technology involved in that particular aspect when we think about it. So VPNs, for example, um, is, is at another layer. Or you know, blocking of uh, websites is at a different layer. And when we think about regulation, uh, to understand the, the, the target of the regulation or the law that we are making uh, is directed at that particular layer. Because earlier, one, one lesson we learned was uh, the intention of the EU GDPR, for example, was really targeted at the content side of things. So, uh, you know, it was uh, very obvious and the regulators themselves mentioned the targets were Facebook and Google. That was their target. But the unintended consequence of that legislation actually hit the, uh, the technical functioning of the internet. So the same colleagues in Europe who are fighting cybercrime can no longer use the system that's now blocked by the colleagues in the, on the legislation side that uh, worked on data privacy. So the takeaway message is, is as we use internet more and more, there will be more of these aspects that will cross into each other. Uh, but it's important for us as a, as a whole, everybody understands which technology is involved in which area. And when we think about working on legislation or regulation, targeting these areas, we are able to be more focused without having unintended cons consequences, on, consequences on other layers. Please. Good morning. My name is Robert Alai. I uh, was formerly a blogger, but now a parliamentarian in Kenya, the city of Nairobi. My understanding of the data request service is that it might also be abused by regimes which are not very friendly to activists and bloggers in, in spaces. So I, I wanted to know the process, the, the request flow chart. I don't see the validation. How do you know a safe request? Because you can have a police state requesting to know the identity of a blogger revealing corruption cases. And then when you expose the identity, you actually sign the death warrant for the blogger and they're executed on site. So how do you ensure that, like the Google request and the Facebook request, uh, we protect also those who matter, the bloggers, the activists in, in states where they're not so free? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so regarding the registration data request service, and we have an actual expert in the room, so I'll call on Yuko in a bit. Um, the, the intention is that requesters, most of them will be uh, either cybersecurity professionals, uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, or IP attorneys when it comes to trademark infringement. They have to create an account and when they do the cr creation of the account, they have to fill up various information and then there's some verification process. So, um, so that's the one side. The registrars on the other side, when they receive the request, uh, then they will then respond accordingly. That process is already uh, done. So right now the, the issue is that when, let's say I'm a law enforcement agency from Singapore and I have to write to uh, a registrar who is in the US. So how do they even know who I am, right? I just put my, my email and then I, I have uh, my uh, credentials, I put it below as a signature, 
but there's no way they can verify at all. So that's the challenge. Um, but may I, may I give a couple of minutes for Yuko to share about the process? My name is Yuko from ICANN organization. Uh, I would like to first mention that this topic will be heavily covered on Tuesday's session. Uh, it is called Current Development in DNS Privacy. It will be in workshop room two at 1545. And I will have an in-depth presentation about this system that we're building. But in terms of um, how do we make sure that the registrant information is not abused or incorrectly um, disclosed? It is currently uh, solely based on registrar uh, and registry, the data holder's discretion that we make sure that registry or registrar who were asked for registrant information to make sure that they assess the request in full and based on their local law that uh, they would determine uh, whether to disclose the requested personal information, um, meaning that they would have to do the balancing test of whether uh, security of the matter at hand and uh, the matter of privacy protection of the individual, such as bloggers that were mentioned, um, and they would have to make that determination. And as of right now, there is no way for us to validate the requester in terms of systematic way of validating, yes, you're from CIA, or yes, you're from FBI, or yes, you're a police force from this country or that country. There are no systemic way to validate that, although that topic is in discussion within the ICANN community, and there could be a future of such a centralized system that could validate the identity of the requester and to accredit them so that um, the request may take a little quicker path of being reviewed by data holders on whether to disclose the data or not. But that is something in the future, and as of right now, uh, all requests must be reviewed by individual data holder to, to validate their identity, make sure that they're disclosing the data based on the local law. I hope that makes sense, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Yuko. Okay, uh, Pablo. Would you like to talk to us a little bit about IP addressing? Sure. Is it possible to show my screen? Yeah, can you see that? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll go to this basic question about who runs the internet and the possible answers that we have these days, uh, which are, are changing quite a bit. Uh, particularly as, as these guys have become more and more prevalent and uh, more powerful as well. Um, so there is, in some places, this uh, belief that the internet is uh, Facebook or the internet is um, uh, TikTok, uh, and, and it is not necessarily so. Uh, there is also sort of those uh, big uh, network operators, mostly mobile these days, uh, that are the ones that actually provide connectivity. So these services are on top of these services, which is quite interesting as well. And obviously there are many different ways in which you can connect to the internet these days. There are like the fixed uh, uh, networks and there are also the satellite networks, low orbit or um, geostationary. Um, I don't know if you have heard about these guys, but they are quite important because they bring uh, a lot of the content uh, closer to where uh, the uh, users are accessing it. So it's a, a very important service these days. Uh, we have talked a lot about whether states are the ones that run the internet and have power of it or can regulate that, such as, for example, the recent GDPR. So most of the time when you ask a, a non-technical person who runs the internet, the answers are more or less around sort of this box. Uh, 
Uh, however, we come from a history, and actually this Internet Governance Forum has been very much part of that history uh, of, of evolution, right? And, and there is always like this tension between the governments and the, let's say, Internet giants. And the Internet giants can be platforms, can be operators, can be um, uh, content um, uh, operators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are more players in the ecosystem in addition to uh, this um, sort of uh, version of who controls the internet. And here is uh, where we go very back in time, 20 years ago, when the layers uh, were starting to sort of be differentiated more and more. And we have the sort of physical uh, layer of uh, antennas for mo um, mobile services or fixed lines or submarine cables, and we can see and grasp uh, that infrastructure, which usually uh, requires a lot of uh, expense uh, and a lot of um, sort of deployment uh, techniques. The middle layer is the one that Jarong and myself were talking about, and for many is uh, kind of invisible. It's a, a layer of the technical standards such as uh, the uh, domain name uh, system or domain names and the IP addresses. Uh, it's something that uh, if you are not very technical, you don't see very much. Uh, and it is a, a layer that requires coordination at many different uh, levels, geographic coordination, uh, but also um, uh, between different uh, services. The, the ones that we can see more and more and where most of the governance challenges that are being discussed uh, in this forum are now very much on the upper layer of content and applications, including artificial intelligence, for example. These are the things that we grasp uh, more and more as where most of the problems are. For example, individuals trying to pretend that uh, they are uh, someone else, like a bank, and then committing sort of old-style crimes with new technologies in new places. Um, so, as, as I said before, it is very important that to each problem assign a technology, a layer, and uh, by understanding sort of where does that come from, then solutions or attribution uh, uh, can emerge and arise. And also, of course, mitigation before we end up needing, uh, as our colleague said, to um, uh, find a particular uh, um, uh, person who commits a crime. So ar around that, um, sort of the system of unique identifiers, this is sort of a different version of the slides that Jarong presented. I said that there are so many devices connected through different networks, uh, small and big networks, and in order to arrive from one point of uh, a network to another point of the network, a very special um, sort of feature or the ones that allow for that to happen are IP addresses. And um, the um, friendly version uh, of, of IP addresses is the domain name system, and that is only used by the human beings because all the devices that are not humans mostly don't need the domain name sy system. The domain names is because we have an easier way uh, to call things by name rather than memorizing a string of uh, numbers. So it's a, a, a really friendly way in which we can uh, uh, just type uh, an address uh, and a catchy um, address either with a country code at the end or with a crazy GTLD. I was uh, having a conversation with a person of dot one. I don't know if you have heard of it. Uh, so uh, Danny dot one uh, was a friend that I just met recently uh, with that website. So there is uh, sort of this system uh, that works a little bit on a hierarchy that uh, starts uh, with the root, then with the top level domain names, and there's a lot of policies uh, around how um, to um, generate new top level domains, uh, and there's also a lot of policies downstream with the country codes and um, the um, uh, different services. So um, Jaron talked about the process of resolution of a domain name and translating that into an IP address to uh, enable that 
um, exchange uh, of communications. And what I want to get there without going into sort of the, how does it really works into the detail is that in the last 20 years there have been many changes in the internet governance landscape. Uh, so, so internet governance as it was defined uh, 20 uh, years, uh, well, a little bit less than 20 years, but it's about the principles, norms, and decision maker making procedures that effectively shape the evolution and use of the internet. Initially, or for many years, most of these norms and um, processes were applied to that middle layer or logical layer of uh, the internet protocols, uh, like domain names and IP addresses. And there is a lot of history about how we come up with the governance and the institutions that help to coordinate that hierarchy of things that are very much invisible uh, to the uh, non-technical uh, uh, people. Um, so this, this history started sort of in the late 80s when the organizations uh, started to emerge. Um, of course, the, the one that deals with defining the protocols and then uh, in the early 90s, the registries, uh, as I've said, there are um, regional internet registries that uh, allocate from the um, global pool of IP addresses into networks in the different regions. Uh, so there are three uh, regional internet registries uh, that uh, started to operate and then converged in this uh, umbrella organization, which is ICANN, that uh, dealt with both uh, global policies for the domain name system, and also uh, at the global level, uh, the uh, internet numbering. Uh, so this is a timeline of the registries, uh, sort of Europe, uh, Asia Pacific, where I work for, APNIC, uh, ARIN in North America and the Caribbean, ICANN globally, uh, LACNIC Latin America, then a collective of the RIRs, so coordination mechanisms around um, uh, all these organizations. And altogether, there are literally hundreds of organizations, not uh, represented here because there is not a, a enough space, but there are many organizations that help to coordinate uh, these uh, resources. There are many registries, there are many registrars, uh, and, and what is beautiful about it is that there is um, sort of a, a collaborative approach uh, to the um, um, healthy, global, um, um, stable, and secure internet. And, and this is just an ecosystem on that middle layer. Uh, and, and I think uh, through that uh, 20 or so year process, there are many lessons learned uh, about um, sort of how we can have the technical community with the policy makers, with the commercial enterprises, uh, work together in a collaborative way to set policies and resolve problems uh, on, on these um, aspects of things. And these are narrow sets of problems uh, that have had that history of evolution. And there are many new problems that are being discussed here uh, in, in the IGF that uh, still may require a similar history, uh, hopefully learning some of the lessons that uh, we had throughout the years in order to solve more complicated problems such as artificial intelligence and others that rely absolutely on the good working of the internet uh, for that to happen. I will leave it here. Um, maybe I, uh, I expanded more than needed. Thank you so much, Pablo. So Pablo talked about how in modern times now for internet governance we have to balance. We have to balance technical considerations, policy considerations, commercial considerations. We have stakeholders from academia, stakeholders, individuals around the world. And we have to do all this within a fairly complicated technical infrastructure, right? The whole thing is built on a set of protocols. And it's funny because I've been doing this for about 25 years now. And I remember, but I wasn't trained to do this. When I was a young man, my background, my training, was in broadcast engineering, television. And when I left university and got my first job, 
it was actually producing television shows, okay? This made my mother very happy. This made my mother happy because when people would ask her about her son, David, what, how is David doing? What's he up to now? She could tell them. She could say, David produces these television shows that you're watching. But in 1999, I switched gears and I started working in internet engineering. And so I started working with these things that Ji Rong and Pablo have been talking about, IP addresses, domain names, reverse DNS, BGP routing. And in 1999, these words were like a foreign language to my mother. She didn't know what they meant. Well, my, it's part of that is because my mother was born in 1945. And in 1945, the most advanced piece of technology in her house was a radio. Later, it became a television. And then in the 1960s, it became a color television. And that was cool. For many years, that color television was the most impactful piece of technology in my mother's world. In 1999, yeah, she had a computer at work, wasn't necessarily connected to the internet. But move forward, it's 2023, and everyone in this room is carrying around a supercomputer in their pocket. They have a device that connects them to all the information in the world that they can find. My mother calls me up one day and she says, David, I finally get it. I'm like what? I understand what you do now. Oh, she was watching a documentary about a really cool technology that allows surgeons in any part of the world to perform surgery on somebody on another side of the world using a robot remote robotic surgery. And she said, David, you did that. I'm like, what? No, I didn't. Those are robotic engineers. Those are incredibly advanced medical doctors. And what they're doing is they're harnessing all this technology that we have today in 2023 to perform surgery, advanced surgery, in parts of the world that didn't necessarily have access to that just yesterday. She goes, no, I know you're not a doctor, David, although you should have been. You're not a doctor, but you've built the platform that this technology uses. I said, what? You're right. You're right. Because what allows the internet to work, and the way I always explained it, that was most understandable, was it's because we use a common set of protocols. And that, my friends, is very different. Because not a lot of the things that we do in this world do so. If you look in my wallet right now, you'll find a Japanese yen, you'll find euros, you'll find American dollars. But if you think about it, that's kind of absurd. Because in 2023, the purpose of currency is the same thing. It's because I want to buy something. It's nothing that interesting about currency. It's just a way for me to buy something. But we haven't standardized on what, po what currencies we use around the world. We're here today in Kyoto, but many of us are visitors to this beautiful country. And what's the one thing we all have in common as visitors here? In order to charge our devices, in order to charge our laptops, we have to carry an adapter. Why? Because the shapes of the plugs and the voltages they use are different. We have standards for them. We just have many different standards for them. In Japan, we drive, when you drive a vehicle, you drive on the left side of the road with a steering wheel on the right side of the car. But in other parts of the world, we drive on the right side of the road, the steering wheel's on the left side. Now, that makes it challenging for you and I as drivers, but it also makes it really challenging for manufacturers of vehicles because they have to apply different manufacturing standards based on where the steering wheel is and all the other ancillary effects there. But internet doesn't work like that. In 1969, when they were developing this, a group of PhD students were developing this internet. Four people sat around and they were trying to solve an engineering problem with some of the earliest pieces of internet equipment. And what they did is they wrote a document. They put together a document for what their proposed solution for this challenge was. And they called it an RFC, a request for comments. And in 1969, they published RFC number one. In 1986, the Internet Engineering Task Force was created and it was 
carrying on this work of standards development, becoming the home of these RFCs. And today, in 2023, we're publishing RFC 10,000. This Internet Engineering Task Force is one of many standards development organizations that exist in the world. You've heard of many of them. You've heard of the IEEE, about electricity and electronics. You may have heard of the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. But at its fundamental level, the Internet is built off standards that are developed at the IETF. And the IETF doesn't work like lots of other standards organizations do. It works from the bottom up. It's truly multi-stakeholder. And the way it's truly multi-stakeholder is anybody can participate simply by having an interest. It has no members. It has no member dues. And while the IETF does have face-to-face -face meetings three times a year, those are actually the least important part of developing protocols. You never have to show up at any point in your life to an IETF physical meeting or participate online virtually. You don't have to do that because the most important work of the IETF happens on mailing lists, email, which makes it accessible to most people in the world who are interested in developing policy. The IP addresses that Pablo's organizations helped register were standardized in 1981. The DNS that Jia Rong was describing was standardized in 1983. The system of routing that allows all networks to connect to each other was standardized in 1995. That's pretty cool if you think about it. These are really old standards, but when we think about technology, we think about the newest technology. What's the newest phone? Remote robotic surgery, AI, machine learning. The newest technology is the best technology because it impacts us the most. Yet it's all built on technologies that's 30, 40, and 50 years old. All because of multi-stakeholderism, all because we entrust engineers to build the mo to develop with quality engineering protocols that we can innovate from, that we can build these applications on. So, <clears throat> as parliamentarians, as legislators, as policymakers, you also have a role in protocol development. Because it's 2023 and the internet is involved in everything in our life, and we can't just do protocol development in a vacuum anymore can't just be the engineers, because when we engineer things, there are real-world consequences to all of us, to bloggers, to students, to people who need medical care, and to just you and me who are trying to look up how to get the right train to go downtown. We rely, all of us in everything we do rely on this. So as legislators, as policymakers, it's important that you get involved in policymaking to lend your expertise to engineers as they develop the technologies of tomorrow. At the same time, it's also important to respect that it has been the efforts of these engineers that have helped develop this, this incredibly globally interconnected system that we all use and we all call the internet. So that is our remarks about how the DNS, about how internet IP addresses, and really about how the fundamental protocols that all applications are built on are what enable a safe and a secure and an interoperable internet for everybody to use. We still have a little bit of time left, so if anybody would like to come up to the mic, please do so and ask some questions. Hi, I'm Barry Lieber. I work in the IETF, Developing Standards. I work in ICANN on the Security and Stability Advisory Committee. Uh, I work in ISOC, the Internet Society. Uh, I've got a lot of roles in all of this. I'm speaking for myself, but that's my background and how I know about this stuff. And I want to highlight a few of the things that this panel has said and that some of um, the people from the floor have said. Uh, we've brought up issues of DNS and the stability and security of that. We've brought up IP spoofing. Uh, we've looked at routing security and a, a lot of things like that. 
um, each of these is a different piece of how the internet is put together and how it fits together is important and somewhat complicated. And um, David pointed out how old some of these standards are, and yet we are still updating them. We are still making changes to them. We have relatively recently added protocols to the DNS to uh, use encryption in DNS resolution. Um, we've added more routing security protocols. We, we continue to update this stuff as it goes. So while they are old protocols, they're not crusty and unmaintained. They, they, they are modern. So it's kind of an interesting balance. Um, and, and the technologists at the IETF and, and around other places are continuing to work on this. There's a, a project called Manners that started off under the auspices of the Internet Society and is now on its own um, cycle. Uh, the mutually agreed norms for routing security. Uh, mutually agreed is the important thing here. There are technologists and operators and the people who, uh, who run the communication systems are getting together and saying, here is the best way to make sure that this is safe and secure, and we're going to agree on, on, on norms, on best practices for how this works and how this stays secure. So I think one of the things that I would like to see people take out of this is that the technologists are watching this, they're monitoring this. We are, we are looking at this day to day and working on keeping the protocols secure and updating them. And what we would like to see from the regulators is to let us do the technology work and then have the regulators go um, let us know what you need and then take the other side of it and recommend the application of the technology that we have developed. Um, so that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Please. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Shoaiba Fulabi Salisu. I am a senator from Nigeria, and I chair the committee of the Senate on ICT and Cybersecurity. For me, I think the United Nations may be seated somewhere in New York. But the real United Nations now is the internet. Internet is the through United Nations that, con that connects not just governments that sit down in New York, but that connects citizens across the continent and across the globe. Now, three of you have spoken very well about how internet is governed by multi-stakeholders platforms. But my concern is, is this multi stakeholder platform through the reflective of all the challenges and aspirations and peculiarities of all the continents of the world are not just as symbolic as United Nations is. The second question for me is the internet governance, and I think three of you mentioned that, is moving away from protocols, from standards, because the protocols and standards are value neutral. What is not value neutral is the application of these protocols. Are we, and we are gonna be seeing more and more government interest in the internet governance space, artificial intelligence, blockchain, social media. No government can be truly, truly neutral about the use of this application. How do we ensure that as the internet begins to expand and be more and more ubiquitous, covering all spheres of our life, the government needs to regulate and the citizens need to be truly global and free and manage in such a delicate manner. This is where the parliamentarians can now come in to enact laws and legislative interventions to ensure this delicate balance. I love that intervention. Uh, I would love to keep the transcript of it because I think it was um, very deep in two senses in terms of the aspect of what is international and then the, the 
the depth of the connections that sort of um, link uh, humanity r around the world and how those things uh, cross borders in uh, unusual ways without respecting like firm uh, frontiers. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer that the multilateral world such as the space where we are discussing this in an open and multi-stakeholder way can coexist and should uh, live together with the multi-stakeholder world. I don't think they are two um, separate things. Actually, I think they are good for the narrow set of problems that they are designed to, to build. I also think that there is no one multi-stakeholder model and one multilateral model. It, there is uh, a, a wide degree of governance um, models to tackle different things. Organizations have their own governance according to their own needs, and so states, and so uh, the internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think. Um, where the, the, there is this, this fantastic element or interaction between technological problems uh, and how they cannot be resolved only through technology, but they also require good governance. And I think that's the history that uh, we are building uh, one step at a time in a very evolutionary and careful kind of way. And now more and more careful because of how much we depend on these infrastructures. And as this becomes more and more critical, then I think um, more and more uh, support from uh, the um, multilateral arena is needed as well. Thank you. Uh, Senator from Nigeria, your, your questions are the same questions all of us are thinking about, but you articulated it in such, a, uh, in such an eloquent way. Um, the, I don't think any of us has the answer specifically to how things may be. Um, but I think how you pointed it out is that um, indeed the internet is, can be seen as a kind of United Nations that connects all of us. And vis-a-vis -vis the current landscape, uh, as what David mentioned, is, is somehow, in my own personal view, an accident that we stumbled upon the internet that is global and open for everybody to join. Because it kind of works against how naturally people want to do things. For example, when we talk about blockchain, people want to build their own systems very quickly. Um, and now we move, then we move into metaverse and everyone wanted to focus on their own standard, own system. They try to be the biggest. And in some ways, it is like building a, their own world garden. Um, and there is an economic driver behind this, right? If I get more users within my, my own world garden, then I have economic incentive to do so. But the internet, funnily, does not work the same way. Yeah, it, it worked in such a way that everyone's free to join. You're free to join and um, you can do whatever you like with it, which is quite strange. And I think the fact that we stumbled upon it as one humanity, we should try to work to maintain it and evolve it, update it, such that it continues to be open and free. And that would then allow us to um, address some of the challenges that we have going forward. But there will always be that inherent tension because as we develop new applications, new technologies, the natural inclination for whoever developed it is to own their, their rights, is to try to keep the users within them. But fundamentally, at the internet level, we have to think outside of this usual uh, uh, economic incentive, in incentive. And that's where the challenge is. And I think that's why um, when it comes to thinking about models, as Pablo mentioned, there, there isn't one fixed, perfect model, but rather something that we have to think about evolving as we go along. And likewise, like learning from history, in terms of the multi-stakeholder model for the Internet Engineering Task Force, 
that started as something just amongst a group of people and academics, and later on opened up to global communities to come together. And I think perhaps that would continue to give the Internet Governance Forum, the global IGF, a space as we continue to think about how do we evolve our model for governance and to include, the, the, to think about the different challenges that we have. Um, because there's always going to be that inherent conflict or tension between keeping an open internet versus the, you know, incentivizing innovation, uh, but it tends to have the economic dry, uh, incentive. So we're just leaving it there. Thank you. Okay, I think that's a good place to end. Uh, I would like to thank you all for listening and for some great questions. Uh, Pablo Inojoso from APNIC, thank you so much. Gia Ronglo from ICANN, thank you so much. Let's keep the conversation going this week, and I wish you a successful and productive IGF. Thank you, everybody.